Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming to the Data Colada seminar series. I'm Leif Nelson, and it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Joe Hilgard. Uh, we will be joined as well by a set of panelists that will be totally great and fantastic today. That is Nick Brown, Malta Elson, Julia Hoff, James Heathers, and Alice Moon. Uh, Joe Simmons and Yuri Simonson are both dealing with teaching obligations this morning and will arrive uh, fashionably late to the seminar, but they will be part of it as well. Uh, for those of you who haven't been here before, there's a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen where you can submit questions or comments during Joe's talk. He will be busy presenting to us, but the rest of the panelists will have a chance to read those, and when, and when possible, we will voice them to, to Joe. Even if we don't have a chance to say them, they all get recorded, so I'll be able to share them with Joe after he's finished with his, his talk as well. So feel free to submit them as, as things go. Uh, beyond that, uh, I'll give the floor over to Joe. It's all yours. Thanks. All right, thank you so much. Um, thank you for having me here today, and um, thank everybody for attending, and thanks especially to the panelists for joining me today. Um, what I'd like to talk with you about today is how do we make science self-correcting? Um, the dream of science is that it is a uniquely powerful way of knowing. And one of the things that supposedly makes it so powerful for knowing is that it's self-correcting. We expect scientists to treat each other's results with the sort of organized skepticism that we're going to poke and prod at each other's reports. We're going to explore possible alternative explanations. We're going to look for possible mistakes. Um, and this is the sort of thing that's supposed to make science so darn useful. And it also sounds just pretty tough and pretty cool. Um, the motto of the Royal Society all the way back in the 17th century was nullius in verba, meaning take no one's word for it. So this is the sort of thing that we pride ourselves on, this organized skepticism, this checking each other. Um, now, I have some experiences in trying to correct the record. They don't maybe compare to those of uh, uh, Joe Simmons or Uri Simonson, um, but we can talk about those all the same today. Um, basically, for minor mistakes and well-meaning authors, things generally work pretty well. But outside of that, I feel like there is room for improvement. Um, the institutions of science that are supposed to support scientific self-correction don't always seem to be particularly well designed for that purpose. We're missing certain tools, we're missing certain procedures, we're missing a set of checks and balances that would allow us to do this work effectively. So in this talk, I'd like to share with you two experiences I've had in identifying and trying to correct for scientific errors. Um, these two experiences I think are worth sharing with you because they're instructive on how to identify and report errors. Um, they show two different ways that maybe we can identify errors, um, and they can also kind of highlight just how difficult it can be to fix things when you see something is wrong. Um, so let's start by talking about a paper that I think has some very flawed raw data in it um, and how it has taken me four years and counting to point that out. So the study in question is a longitudinal experiment testing the effects of violent video games on aggressive behavior. Um, this is an experiment in that participants are randomly assigned to play either a violent or nonviolent video game. Um, and it's a longitudinal study in the sense that they play that video game for 20 minutes a day for three consecutive days, each day completing a measurement of aggressive thoughts and a measurement of aggressive behavior. So it's an experiment and it's longitudinal. This is kind of a big deal because it expands on the previous experimental literature by testing how these effects might accumulate across repeated play sessions. Um, so to talk to you about this paper, I have to tell you about one of the dependent variables here. I'm going to focus on the measurement of aggressive thoughts that they use, because that's where the error is most striking and most in need of correction. Um, the task here is called uh, the story completion task. It's a projective measurement of participants' aggressive thoughts. Um, in this task, participants read a short story prompt, and then they're asked to list 20 things that the character in that story might do, say, think, or feel next. So a story prompt might be something like, Todd is driving home from work. He stops at a stoplight. He's rear-ended. Tell me what happens next. 
or um, Judy is trying to convince her friend to go on a beach vacation with her. Um, but Judy's friend says, no, I'm trying to save money for a new phone. Um, so what happens next? Then research participants rate those responses on a one to seven scale where one is totally nonviolent and seven is totally violent. So um, if Todd gets out and uh, exchanges insurance information with the other guy, that gets a one. If Todd gets out and fires a bazooka at the other guy's car, that earns a seven. Um, so the logic of this experiment goes something like this. Among participants who play a violent video game, some amount of that violence becomes integrated into their understanding of the world. And this causes what researchers call a hostile expectation bias, the expectation that ambiguous behaviors contain some hostile intent. Um, so if I accidentally spill my drink on somebody with higher hostile expectation bias, he might think that I did that on purpose and he'll want to fight me. Uh, violent video games are expected to increase this hostile expectation bias because the characters in violent video games are generally hostile. Um, the characters in them are out to get you. Um, so the depiction of this hostile world in the video game is hypothesized to affect players' understanding of what the world is. So when we give the participant that story stem from that story completion task, asking what Todd will do when he gets rear-ended at a stoplight, um, perhaps the participant is going to report Todd will behave more aggressively than had they not played this violent video game. On the other hand, participants in the control group are expected to not have their worldview or expectations changed in this way. So when we ask what Todd will do after this fender bender, they're expected to say something more socially normal and less hostile, like Todd will ask for the other guy's insurance or he'll call emergency services. Now this hypothesized pattern is exactly what the authors observe. Um, not only that, the effect accumulates from day to day. Um, people generate more hostile expectations in the violent condition and fewer in the nonviolent condition. Um, so after the first 20 minutes on day one, that's a statistically significant effect. After the second day's 20 minutes, it's a larger effect. And after the third day's 20 minutes, the effect is larger still. It's very tidy. The p-values on it are great. I read this one back in graduate school and I thought, wow, very good, pretty convincing stuff. Um, it wasn't until a few years later that I realized that there had to be mis some mistake. Um, the mistake, I think, is evident when we look at these standard error bars. Um, this is a between subjects experiment with 35 participants per cell. That's not an enormous sample size. And so at that sample size, we would probably expect these standard error bars to be a bit wider. That these standard error bars are so narrow indicates very little within group variability. Participants who play the same video game are generating extremely similar story completion task scores as each other, um, but still very differently from participants in the other condition. We can describe this as a standardized effect size. Um, and so this is a big effect. The averages of these two groups are separated by three and a half standard deviations. People who played a violent video game are over here. People who played a nonviolent video game on day three are over here. Um, these are really impressive results. But what I want to ask you is, are they plausible? What sort of effect sizes should we expect from an experiment like this? Um, I'm going to cite some data from Uri, Joe, and Leif that I love a lot. Um, they have a talk called Life After P-Hacking, for which they collected some data to help psychologists train their intuitions for what small, medium, and large effect sizes look like so that we could start doing power analysis in a more effective and thoughtful way. Um, so what they did for this was they collected MTurk data on some really obvious phenomena, and they described the results in terms of standardized effect sizes. For example, one obvious difference is that liberals and conservatives tend to want different things on average. Liberals are more likely to say that social equality is important conservatives are less likely to say that social equality is that important. Um, this is a big effect size. This is 0.7 standard deviations. So this is maybe the sort of phenomenon we're thinking of when we say a big effect in social psychology. Outside of social psychology, we can get bigger effects. Um, one obvious effect in the real world is that men are on average taller than women. Um, and that's a difference of 1.8 standard deviations. Now, this is such a large and obvious difference 
that you don't really need to run a study to confirm this, right? Um, you can kind of see this as you go around in the world. Society has already noticed this effect and adapted to it. Men's clothing sizes are generally larger than women's clothing sizes. Um, and yet, you still have some men who are shorter than the average woman. You have some women who are taller than the average men. And you have all these people in between here where you would have a hard time guessing their gender based only on their height. So when you tell me that playing a violent video game for one cumulative hour across three days increases aggressive thoughts and the size of that difference is nearly twice the size of difference in male and female heights, I say that there surely must be something wrong with that data because that effect is way too big to accurately represent the studied effect. Um, if it were true, we wouldn't be debating whether violent video games had effects on people. It would be obvious, and we would have had to adapt to deal with these effects to ensure our own survival. Because every time a new popular violent video game was released, um, all the players would turn into monsters and the country would descend into a scene from the purge. We would have to deploy the National Guard before each new Grand Theft Auto game comes out. Um, that's not been my experience, so I think that this effect is just too darn big. So what has been challenging about making this argument at the journal level is that to make this argument requires using your priors. Um, as a Bayesian, at least a part-time Bayesian, I know that people tend to get kind of antsy about using priors because priors can be a little subjective. I think that this is too big to be believed. Other people might feel differently. Um, so as a consequence, we find ourselves in what James here calls Hilgard's lament. Um, there's no way to contest the ridiculous data because simply saying the data are ridiculous is not itself an empirical argument. Um, so I needed a way to make this argument empirical. Um, and there were a number of reasons I didn't want to uh, just conduct a direct replication. Um, for starters, it would be a lot of work for very little payout. Um, to rerun this three-day longitudinal experiment myself. Um, additionally, if I ran a direct replication and I failed to get those same results, those differences could be attributed to any number of potential moderators. Um, the original study was conducted in France. My study would be in America. Um, seven years had passed since the publication of the original report, so maybe something has changed about people or video games or the measures or the world. Um, and last, it's possible that I just don't have the necessary flair or expertise to obtain an effect of this size. Um, when I run a study like this one, usually within one session, some of my participants are able to figure out that I'm studying the effects of violent video games on aggressive behavior, and I have to throw their data out. Um, these researchers were able to guide participants through three consecutive sessions without a single participant figuring out what the study was about. And I knew that I would not be that lucky. And so that would maybe say, you know, you got a smaller effect because you just did it wrong. So eventually I designed what I call a maximal positive control. In most psychological research, we're used to running what are called negative controls. These are control conditions that are lacking the treatment of interest. Um, so that provides us with a reference group with no change. But outside of psychology, and to a growing extent in psychology, there are also what are called positive controls. These are control conditions that should always return an effect of a certain size. Um, so in biology, for example, um, you could purchase from this antibody company a positive control that helps you make sure that your measurements are working correctly. Um, you load your machine with these different concentrations of this stuff and you know that it should come back with this particular reading. Um, and so what's useful about this is it helps you make sure that your measurements are working correctly. Because if the measurement doesn't show up, doesn't find that material in your treatment group, but it does find it in the positive control, you know that the measurement is working fine and it's the hypothesis that didn't work. Um, but if the substance doesn't show up in neither the treatment group nor the positive control, then you know that you must have screwed something up with the measurement. Um, this is, could be very useful in psychology where when we get a null result, we do a lot of arguing about 
whether the measurement worked or whether the hypothesis worked. Um, so it's kind of like a manipulation check. Um, in a manipulation check, we keep the independent variable and use a DV that we know should be sensitive to it. Here, we keep the dependent variable and we use a different independent variable that we know must affect it. So what's going to make this, maxim, uh, this positive control maximal is that we're going to design it so that yields what should probably be the largest effect you could possibly get on the measure. Um, so we'll use a manipulation that ought to just find strictly a bigger effect than 3.5 standard deviations. Um, so whereas in the original study, participants play this game and they indicate what a generic character like Todd or Janet would do, um, I asked participants directly about the characters from the video game. Participants in the treatment group played, uh, watched the character from Grand Theft Auto murder everybody in a strip club and then go outside and engage in a shootout with the police. Um, I asked them then to complete the story completion task asking specifically about that character. What does the mass murderer guy from Grand Theft Auto do when he gets rear-ended? Um, and predictably, participants say, well, he's going to Grand Theft Auto on the other guy. Um, for the control group, I asked participants to watch footage of the nonviolent video game and tell me what that race car driver would do. Um, and so they came up with things that that extreme sports guy would do. Um, this should be a much simpler, more powerful manipulation. It doesn't require any sort of activation of schemata or integration of information to a worldview or anything like that. It's simply tell me what a murderer would do versus tell me what a normal person would do. Um, so in that original study, they got an effect of three and a half standard deviations. What did I get in my maximal positive control, which should yield an even bigger effect? I found an effect of only 1.7 standard deviations. It is less than half that size. Um, as an additional check, I performed a systematic review. I looked for other experiments that had used this measure as an outcome. Um, it turns out that there are only three studies that have ever reported effects on this measure larger than 1.7 standard deviations, indicated with the arrow here. Um, and they all have the same author team. Um, and so it seems like there's some sort of recurring effect of author that is associated with effects of this magnitude. Um, the senior authors are aware of this criticism, but they have not offered to retract the articles. Um, I think that's a problem because these articles have been a bit influential. Um, several of these have been included in meta-analyses. Um, one, this one in particular has been included in the meta-analysis behind the American Psychological Association's current task force statement on the effects of violent media. Um, James. Yeah, just for a bit of fun um, from elsewhere, uh, I, before we get off the topic of effect sizes, um, I aggregated some a couple of years ago um, and where they would fit into that table, the difference between how blood phobics feel about blood and how needle phobics feel about needles is about, from memory, 1.4 to 1.7 D. Um, and if you want something a little bit more physiological, uh, the immediate effect of there is there is an effect in in physiology uh, called the pressor effect. Um, if you bang people full of a hypoosmotic stimulus, uh, a whole bunch of really interesting things change in them, um, which are vascular and cardiovascular. And I did an experiment once with a maximal hypoosmotic stimulus, which is basically smashing a liter of distilled water into your gastrointestinal tract as fast as possible. The within subjects effect size for that is 1.42. Um, and this is something where if you look at it on, if you look at what the actual biological trace that's being measured is, we won't get into the details, you can see it with your eyes. You don't need to analyze it. It is palpably and immediately visible. It just, yeah. bam, jumps out. Um, in work similar to this, I have used the approximate D value of 1.5 as a point in time where I start to get suspicious. Just a little bit of context for what 3.5 means. Yeah. Yeah, 3.5 is wild. It's like something like 85% of the variance. 
Um, and so as a social psychologist, I'm used to being able to explain like 10% of the variance on a good day, right? Nick? Uh, I like to refer to uh, D equals three as the effect size of bleach, uh, <laughs> based on those commercials that said something that killed 99% of all known germs. Yeah, um, which I, I like to imagine is three is three standard errors in some universe or other. So yeah, the effect size. This is the effect size of bleach. Yeah, it's it's really something else. Um, so this took me four years in the end um, to to get this kind of criticism published um, between corresponding with the authors and uh, corresponding with the editors and getting the raw data and conducting this experiment and then performing a study two and a study three and dealing with reviewer comments. It's taken me four years off and on to make this point. Um, and I'm proud of this paper, but I don't think that this is a sustainable way to correct the scientific literature. You should be able to correct the scientific literature without making a novel contribution to the field. Correction should be valuable in and of itself. Um, so in my dream scenario, um, I would have just within two weeks, you know, called the editor up and said, there's no way, this is the effect size of bleach. And the editor would have said, wow, how did we miss that? We'll get this taken down. Um, this is my fantasy world in which uh, scientific self-correction works rapidly. Um, may I tell you about another story? Okay. So this previous scenario, we talked about the implausibility of effect sizes. Um, in this case, I'd like to talk about the implausibility of the raw data itself. Um, it is challenging to get raw data from an author that doesn't want to give it to you. Um, but if you can get raw data from an author and if you have some expertise in the kind of structure of that task data, um, you might be able to evaluate how plausible that data is. Um, so like the previous example, this work is included in multiple meta-analyses, um, and that is distressing to me because the sample sizes are huge and the raw data looks seriously wrong. Um, so I became aware of this work when Google Scholar um, introduced me to one of several papers by this author. Um, he researches the same topics that I do, but his sample sizes are much, much better. Um, he's publishing studies with sample sizes of 2,000 and 3,000 children randomly assigned to condition, um, basically generating like a whole many labs or a whole meta-analysis worth of data on his own twice a year. Um, but what was frustrating about seeing these huge sample sizes, usually I'm excited to see a huge sample size, um, is that the statistics didn't seem to make much sense. Um, so take, for example, this ANOVA table for a uh, uh, two by two by two by two between subjects and NOVA. Um, I don't know what mean and standard deviation mean in this context. I would have expected them to be like cell averages, but you would need several cell averages. Um, additionally, these significance asterisks are all wrong. Um, not one of them is correct. Uh, so this one should be a single significance asterisk these others should not have any significance asterisks. Um, maybe this is a benign error, but it does not increase my enthusiasm for the work. Um, more distressing, as I read his other papers, uh, was the problem that numbers in tables would seem to reappear from one study to another. Um, so these are three studies using different measures, different stimuli, different populations conducted and published years apart from each other. Um, and yet, many of the numbers are quite similar to each other. Uh, you get a 17, give or take. You get a 10, give or take. And a minus 0.6, give or take. Um, even the F values are quite consistent, right? You get a, a 9 point something, a 9 point something, a 9 point something, a 2.8, a 2.8, a 2.8, a 0 point. Um, and so to get to get all these things to line up like each other, ignoring uh, uh, you know, just running direct replications should be quite unlikely thanks to something like sampling error. Um, to get it to line up like this across totally different studies um, is very surprising. Um, when I notified the authors that the statistics didn't make sense and I notified an editor or two that the statistics didn't make sense, they started issuing corrections. Um, watch very closely uh, for the correction published to this table. 
Are you watching? Here we go. There's the correction. Did you catch it? The entire correction here is just a simple tweak to the units digit of the F value. So here we go from 1.67 to 3.67 or from 6.43 to 1.43. Um, no other numbers in the results known of the descriptive statistics changed, just the F value changed um, to bring those statistics a little closer in line with the F, uh, with the, the significance asterisks. To me, um, I would have liked to see a little bit more in the, in the corrections. Okay, so these things are all kind of concerning on their own, but what really raised my eyebrows was when I received the raw data. Um, and in order to tell you about what's weird about that raw data, I have to first tell you about the task so that you understand the sort of parameters we're expecting to see when we look at this raw data. Um, so many of you will be familiar with kind of the classic color word stroop. Um, in this task, participants are supposed to indicate the color of the ink that the word is printed in. Um, this is very easy to do when the text of the word and the color of the word line up, right? So I can easily go through here saying red, green, and blue. What makes it more challenging is when we have these incongruent trials where participants are supposed to ignore the text of the word and instead read off the color of the ink, but they disagree with each other. So our attention is drawn to the text. We are used to reading off the text and that creates an amount of interference. Um, so participants are slower in this incongruent task to say green, blue, red. Um, this is a pretty clear and pretty strong effect. Um, you can just kind of feel this as you do it yourself. This feels much easier. This feels much harder. The task that's used in these studies that I'm concerned about is called the aggressive emotion stroop. Um, so in this task, instead of congruent and incongruent color words, participants see either neutral words or aggression related words. And the hypothesis here is that to the extent that participants are themselves aggressive or that they have aggressive thoughts activated in their mind, um, their attention will be drawn away from the color of the ink towards reading and processing that word. Um, so each participant ends up with an aggressive emotion Stroop score that consists of their reaction times to aggressive words minus their reaction times to non-aggressive words. Now, this is a much subtler effect than the color word Stroop, right? Um, we feel this Stroop effect. This I'm not sure I feel. Um, and when researchers publish results using this task, um, it tends to be in the realm of maybe five to 30 millisecond difference. Um, so these things are different, but what's important about them that's the same is it's still reaction times, multiple trials nested within subjects to make a difference score. So I started looking at this raw data I obtained and I found features that didn't match what I would have expected from real reaction time data. So here on the left is some color Stroop data I pulled down from the Open Science Framework for comparison. Um, this is a large uh, a body of Stroop data, color word Stroop data, I think collected in the context of the ego depletion experiment. Um, and here across the x-axis, I've averaged within each subject um, their congruent reaction time score and their incongruent reaction time score. I've just put them all in the same histogram. You can see kind of a log normally sort of shape here. It's got a certain smoothness to it. Um, when we look at the data I received from these authors, it is not smooth like that. It's unusually spiky. Um, there are a lot of participants who have an average reaction time of, you know, just about 200 milliseconds. There's a big spike at about 380, but hardly anybody at 390 and more people at 430. Um, it doesn't, I don't have a clear explanation for why this looks so spiky. Another thing we would expect to see in reaction time data is a correlation between conditions within subjects. Um, basically reaction type times from one trial to the next should look kind of like each other because they're coming from the same person. Um, so even though some conditions are faster and easier than others, congruent trials are easier than incongruent trials. 
Um, we should also see an effect of participants. Some people are just going to be faster overall than other people, and other people are going to be slower overall than other people. Um, so for example, here in the open science frameworks group data, we have somebody who, yeah, they're a little bit, um, um, here's somebody, for example, a little bit slower in the incongruent word condition than in the congruent word condition, but they're just a fast person overall. They've got about reaction time of 400 milliseconds overall. Out here, we have somebody who's just kind of slow overall, uh, 800 milliseconds in the congruent task, 1000 milliseconds, give or take, in the incongruent task. Um, this is a powerful correlation. The fact that these trials are nested within participants creates a strong correlation of 0.92. Um, when we look at Dr. Zhang's data, we don't see that correlation. Um, what we see instead is this very weak uh, correlation and just the unusual boxiness of the distribution of within subject averages. I don't know why so many people have an average of you know, approximately 200 milliseconds um, across this whole spread here or why no, nobody seems to you know, there's this kind of sharp edge here where people get a reaction time of 450 or so, but nobody, you know, slips below that to 440 or 430. Um, it's just strange. Um, I tried writing this up uh, to his institution. Um, after a month, I received an email from that institution saying um, everything's fine here. Um, that he's just very bad at statistical methods, um, but nothing is um, unusual or being done wrong here. Um, that report didn't mention what I thought were maybe the strongest indicators of possible misconduct, which is the funny properties of the raw data and the recycled tables. Um, I don't think that you get your raw data to look like that just by being bad at SPSS. I don't think you publish the same paper, uh, the same table three times by being bad at SPSS. Um, so I was frustrated with the uh, institution. I decided to try to approach the journals to see if I could get some leeway with them. Um, from the journals I've approached, um, so far we've got two retractions um, at Youth and Society. Um, we've got a retraction notice still waiting to be published. Um, eight months ago, personality and individual differences showed me a retraction notice. I'm still waiting for them to publish that retraction notice. Um, and there is an investigation still ongoing at Computers in Human Behavior. Um, but the one that kind of chafes the most for me is that one of the journals decided to correct uh, the article and leave it up. And that is what happened at the journal Aggressive Behavior. Um, let me tell you why this chafes for me, why I'm not satisfied with the process at aggressive behavior. Um, I had four concerns that I raised at, at aggressive behavior. Um, the first two concern properties of the Stroop data. I said the average aggressive emotion Stroop effect in this data is 180 milliseconds. That's very big for this task. Um, it is about five to 30 times bigger than anybody else has reported on this task. And it's larger even than some estimates of the color word Stroop effect, which again, we can feel the color word Stroop effect. I can't feel this one. Um, it's just kind of a, 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 a use your priors sort of scenario. And again, the properties we expect to see in Stroop data are missing. Um, so again, we expect to see that correlation between conditions within subjects. We don't see that really in the, in the data at aggressive behavior. Um, and the editor dismissed these concerns saying, the overall Stroop effects that you're citing are based on adult populations. It's entirely reasonable that the data from children could be different. And I'll grant that I may not know what the mean effect could be for kindergartners, but I do think that properties like this one should still hold um, whatever your age. Sorry, Joe, point of clarification yeah. on that. That is the author's response to you, or that's how the journal responded that, to That you? was the editor's response to my uh, complaint when I said I was dissatisfied with the correction. Huh. Yeah, yeah. Um, we can talk about this more in a second. Um, 
the second issue I raised was that uh, there were pronounced failures of randomization. You could see this just reading the paper. Um, condition was strongly confounded with both sex and trait aggression. So if this was a randomly assigned condition, it didn't seem to work very well. Um, this was the one thing that the correction addressed. Um, the editor told me that it became clear to him that it was a language or translation problem. Um, it was instead a correlational study with children choosing whether they wanted to watch a violent or nonviolent cartoon. Fine. Um, but the last concern, and the one that I have received the least editorial feedback on, is uh, concerning the measurement of aggressive behavior that's collected in this study. Um, on this task, participants um, can basically send an opponent a loud blast of noise, and they can do so at one of four intensities. So that score is either zero, one, two, three, um, how much noise they want to send to their opponent. In the paper, those four trial averages are accumulated to make an average score. Um, so if on the first four trials, I send Maite here a one and then a two and then a two and then a three, that should get averaged into the data as a two. Um, what's remarkable about this in the raw data is that of the 3000 participants and the three four trial averages, 9000 cells in total, every single average is an integer. Um, and when you think about the possible permutations of 0, 1, 2, and 3, combining any four of those at random, um, roughly one third of those permutations comes out as an integer. Um, so the odds that all 9,000 of these have come out to one third, well, um, it's worse than the odds of you flipping a fair coin 9,000 times and getting heads every single time. Um, it's roughly something like putting all your money on 19 at the roulette table and it comes up the next 2,700 spins. Um, so, so something is wrong here. Um, the editor's response on this point was that it appears that I misunderstood the methods or results or misread the data. Um, I said, I have an email from the first author from dated a year ago that says I am correctly understanding how this data was processed and put together. Um, could you please explain to me how I'm wrong? Um, I would love to have the correct understanding. I have not received any further word from the editor. Um, so this is still a mystery to me. Um, Kathleen O'Grady wrote about the retractions here for Science News. And the really interesting thing she found in reporting on this was that the last author explicitly recommended a retraction of this article. Um, and yet the journal went ahead and corrected it and left it up anyway. Um, so I feel strongly that this was the wrong uh, decision. The study has already been included in one meta-analysis. I would really hate to see it included in another meta-analysis. My take. Yeah, will, will you paint the full picture and point out uh, what the um, the editor of aggressive behavior uh, has to do with the authors of the first study you talked about earlier? Oh, um, well, so I, I let's get into that in the discussion. I think you're 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 right you're right with me on um, some of my proposals for how the process could be better. Um, so so just to kind of wrap up this particular uh, uh, soap opera here. Um, this gentleman is still publishing. Um, in the eight months that I've been waiting for personality and individual differences to publish their retraction statement, um, he's published four new publications. Um, he has acquired a new American co-author who has not been super helpful to me. Um, and his methods have improved. Whether, you know, I'm not sure whether, you know, there's misconduct involved here and he's gotten better at concealing it or whether he's just gotten much better at statistics and keeping track of things. Um, but it's, it's hard for me to poke holes in these four new articles. Um, and I'm very tired, so I don't really want to try right now. So this has all been kind of frustrating and difficult. Um, I feel like there's a gap between the way that we say science could correct itself and um, just how much work and how slowly this is operated. 
Um, and again, cases like this where you receive a correction when you really strongly feel that maybe a retraction would have been appropriate. Um, so let's talk about things that we could do to make it better and maybe we can have a little Q&A about these proposals. Um, the first thing that I would like to propose is that I think the APA code of conduct could take a firmer and more explicit stance on how exactly data sharing should work. Um, it says that, quote, psychologists do not withhold the data on which their conclusions are based. It then offers a lot of hedging about who's allowed to ask for that data and under what conditions they're permitted to see that data and what they're allowed to do with that data. Um, but the one thing that it doesn't do is it says, who's going to stop psychologists from withholding their data. Um, so I think that the APA's code of conduct could be substantially improved and strengthened if it provided a little bit of insight into how that data sharing should be supported. Um, whose responsibility is it to prevent authors from withholding their data? Will the journal make them do that? Will the institution make them do that? Um, if authors don't provide the data, what are you willing to do about it? Is this the sort of thing where you would be willing to put an expression of concern on a paper because people have asked for the data and it has not been forthcoming? What sort of timeline is reasonable to expect for this sort of thing? Is two months long enough to wait for a reply? I know everybody's busy. Um, it's kind of one of those frustrating things when you have to spend four months emailing the author asking for the data and looking like a crank, and then four months asking the editor to intervene and looking like a crank to them. Um, it would be nice if we had some kind of clearer guidelines for what's reasonable behavior here. Second, I think it should be, oh, Maite, go ahead. How exactly does the, or would the APA regulate the research practices of a French and a Chinese psychologist? You know, that's an excellent question that I have not thought through well because of my American blinders. Um, I think that there is a lot of room here for judging by how poorly uh, explicated and enforced the American standards are. I can imagine trying to get international standards to be clearly explicated is going to be 20 times as difficult. Um, but I'm telling you kind of my wish list right now. Um, if, I, if, if wishes were horses, I would be writing this particular, yeah. Okay, um, so my second proposal is that it should be much easier to get raw data. Um, I think that raw data should be posted online as part of the publication process. Um, this is something that people have been arguing for since uh, Vickers, Borsboom, Katz, and Molinar tried to ask for data back in 2006. And six months and 400 emails later, they had only gotten data from 25% of the data available on request papers. Um, so we know that data available on request is not available on request. Um, is just a couple of years after that, URI here was uh, publishing just post it, um, highlighting the utility of open data and catching errors and research misconduct. Um, so to me, I, I don't understand why this still is not business as usual. Um, despite all this, the Modal Psychology Journal has no standards or uh, explicit statements, no standards regarding explicit statements about data availability in published research articles. This is what the top guidelines call level zero. Um, I would like to see the standard journal move to level two, which is that data are published to a trusted repository at submission. Um, and it's fine if you can't do that for reasons, but you have to explain those reasons when you submit. If that sounds uh, Procrustean, uh, so be it. Uh, this is my particular perspective. Um, third, it'd be helpful to have some greater accountability and transparency regarding editors' actions. Um, the editor at Aggressive Behavior and I are a bit cross with each other. Um, he's mad at me because I've been a real pain in the ass about this paper and I haven't been willing to let it go. Um, and I'm mad at him because I don't feel like he's addressed my concerns fully. Um, and so I think that this process could really be improved by having a third person in the room to observe and mediate the investigative process. Um, it's currently my impression that nobody checks the editor-in-chief's work 
um, that the editor in chief may not have the necessary expertise to evaluate uh, some of these concerns. Um, so I, I, I think having a third person would be very helpful. Nick. Dr. Brown. Okay. So I would also like to sorry. propose. Oh, sorry, sorry. go ahead. There you are. I, I was muted. Uh, there is always a third person in the room in these discussions. They are known as the publisher. Yes, I had a delightful conversation with somebody at Wiley uh, this morning, actually, um, which may get me a little bit of purchase on this. Um, but until today, I had no idea who this person was or how they, what, you know, whether they had heard my complaints. Um, so I, again, if there is a third person, they're not visible to me, the complainant, um, at least in these experiences I've had. There's a reason for that, and that is because they are standing behind the editor quite often with their hand up their back operating the mechanism. Um, mm -hmm. in, in, in both when it comes to uh, having an institution involved, but also having the publisher involved, there's a fairly simple rule. Uh, no action will be taken by either the university or the publisher until the cost of not acting is visibly to them considerably larger, and there is some hysteresis here, uh, <laughs> than the cost of not doing anything. Yes, um, I feel that I feel that very potently. The idea of the the cost benefit analysis that goes on behind the scenes here, um, I uh, we'll we'll talk about cost benefit in a second here. Um, uh, to get back to something, oh, Julia, go ahead. Hi. Uh, yeah. So uh, there was a um, question by Johannes Breuer in the uh, Q and A, uh, who asks uh, whether um, uh, statistical editors if every journal had those could be involved in a solution uh, for this problem. Um, and maybe from my own perspective, because I don't uh, regularly uh, contact editors uh, to uh, ask them to correct or retract papers, I wonder whether you have an intuition why they are so stubborn about this. Because I mean, I mean, technically they shouldn't be so upset about it, right? It's not their paper. I just, I don't quite understand what the problem is, to be honest. So, um... I can only speculate, uh, but my sense is some of it is cost benefit analysis, like Nick mentions. Um, much of the cost is probably just the work involved in performing an effective investigation and doing things about it. Um, I'm very busy. I don't like doing service work sometimes because I, I, I have other things that I need to do between teaching and research. Um, and I imagine for editors, um, what's interesting and exciting to them is the publication of new papers. And so to go back and litigate previous papers um, doesn't benefit their metrics in any sense. It's not going to help their impact factor. In fact, it may hurt it um, in the case of a well-cited paper like the one we started with here. Um, and it's certainly not rewarding in the way that publishing an exciting new paper might be. My take. Yeah, I mean, also it's not, it's, it's never a pleasant business, right? I mean, you you have to speak to um, another author, maybe someone uh, who works closely in your area, uh, and you sort of have to deal with them on someone else's behalf. And if that person um, is a pain in the ass about it, it's not it doesn't make it better uh, either. So I mm -hmm. kind of understand why people don't really want to do it. I mean. Uh, but of course, maybe but they must, it's the right thing to do it. Right. And so if, if I think if, again, um, I think the idea here of editing the editors is, um, having the sort of accountability for editors to make sure that, um, they are doing this unpleasant, but necessary work, um, of eating their broccoli. Um, another thing I would, uh, suggest kind of going back to something you said earlier, um, was it can be helpful, I think, to have some clear procedures for um, getting editors to uh, disclose potential conflicts of interest, and that includes um, intellectual conflicts of interest. Um, so some of the history here is I used to believe in violent video game effects until I 
couldn't replicate them. And I started doing my own meta-analyses and noticed publication bias. Um, the editor at Aggressive Behavior is um, one of the field's foremost experts on the effects of violent behaviors, uh, sorry, on the effects of violent media on aggressive behavior. Um, he has published books, he's published meta-analyses, he's been doing this work since uh, the days of Zaxxon in the arcade. I think the first paper is like um, 1978 or 1980 something. Um, so he's been publishing significant results on this topic for longer than I've been alive. Um, and so uh, we each kind of have a side on this well-established and often rancorous debate. Um, I think that's another reason that it'd be useful to have like a clear and responsible person that we can delegate to um, so that it's not us just laying into each other and not distrusting each other. Um, on that topic, I think it'd be helpful to have some clear procedures for hand handling appeals. Um, when I didn't feel like the editor considered my uh, concerns thoroughly, um, I didn't know whom I could reach to talk to about that. Um, it's just generally not clear to whom the editor is accountable. Um, so if there were some sort of clear procedure for handling, you know, I told the editor that I couldn't get data out of these guys and the editor blew me off um, or the editor took these serious criticisms and kind of just gave them a new coat of paint with a correction. Um, it would be helpful if there were somebody that you could point towards and say, well, that's the person you should plead your case with. So um, as a final recommendation, oh, Dr. Moon, go ahead. Hi, I just uh, was kind of curious in terms of what we can do as researchers, just um, one to notice some of these things that you are noticing and mm -hmm. also um, echoing something that uh, Andres had, uh, I don't know how to say his name, uh, <laughs> as asking um, to deal with some negative reputational consequences of doing this type of work and trying to help out with any of the self-correcting stuff. Yeah. Um... I really don't know what to do about the reputational consequences. Um, I think this will inherently be a little bit polarizing because um, I think the way that psychological science often operates is something of a guild. Uh, we, we are nice to each other and we talk about the importance of psychological science and the necessity to fund it generously. Um, we want to cheerlead for each other's uh, grants and things like that. Um, and so, in some ways, this is, you know, the sort of circular fight ring squad sort of situation where uh, now we're, you know, picking on somebody who's supposed to be on our team. Um, and so I think that this will often make somebody look like not quite a team player, um, which is why you end up with specifically cantankerous people like um, doctors Heather and Brown here um, doing this sort of work, or at least doing it in a more high profile fashion. I really don't know how to, to make this much better in that sense. I wish I did. Um, I'm open to discussing ideas um, shortly here. James. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned cantankerosity, which is a neologism that I will now be maintaining for several years. Um, that has significant drawbacks. Um, you it's it's impressive in a way actually joe that you've maintained a dialogue with this editor for as long as you have in the first place mm -hmm. because uh, the experience that nick and i have certainly have and this probably goes for uh, other people in the panel when i i don't presume to know is the fact that if you raise a question like this um, my scatter plot of associated within subjects points is square that is a problem now, anyone who's been through first year statistics and has understood how a distribution works and isn't suffering from some kind of colossal head injury knows that that is quite literally impossible. Um, the problem that we have now is simply that people Google you and then they go, oh, I'm not talking to him. <laughs> so more, more than a year ago, um, I, I backed off doing what you're doing right now in a very real way in favor of helping other people and taking absolutely no public credit or space for, for this in, in any way, shape or form. Um, and I think that the responses to, to people who are in the exact situation that you've just been describing are better because I'm not involved. 
Um, the, the simplest way of handling this from a procedural perspective is just to pretend it never happened. And if there's any, if there's any space within how something like this is registered in the first place, the fact that the record that uh, a, a record that a complaint was even raised in the first instance is something that's not only possible, but it's 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 a hell of a good start. Um, there's a, a difference between uh, whether or not something occurred in the first instance and whether or not a correct procedure has been followed. Yeah. Um, and those those records exist at the publisher, um, but they are secret to the remainder of us. And so I think that that's kind of frustrating. Um, so so kind of along the lines of uh, Samin here has been kind of advocating for open peer review, open editorial decisions, um, so that one can see which criticisms were raised in peer review and how those were dealt dealt with. Um, I think it would be very helpful to have a similar level of transparency regarding complaints like mine. Um, so uh, I think if we want to see more of this work, we need to uh, reward and encourage it. Um, unfortunately, I don't think 2020 was the year in which we uh, ensured that science is self-correcting. I think something else happened in 2020, um, but the dream is still alive. Um, and, and for me, I think that a good retraction can be as valuable as several new studies, right? Because you can replicate something until you're blue in the face and it'll still shamble along. A nice retraction can really cut that claim in the bud. Um, it's a, that's a particularly good point. I'm sorry for interrupting, but I want to oh, canvas yeah. everyone's panelist. What is the maximum number of failed replications that you've heard for a single effect? either within a lab or more broadly externally. Because there's a way to quantify what Joe just said. Mm -hmm. And it's what that number is. What's everyone got? Yeah, um, my mind immediately goes to this roll and wire um, original kind of social priming study. Um, the results in that are much, much, much too good to be true. There's basically zero sampling error um, in those like beautifully smooth curves. Um, and I think there have been like one, maybe two many labs replication attempts of those led by my friend Randy McCarthy. Um, it's kind of the theoretical base that gave us um, some of the particular priming effects that failed to replicate in the, the 2000s, 2010s. Um, and so I think that we could have saved, I mean, maybe decades of psychological research um, had we just nipped that one in the bud. Dr. Brown. Mm. Sorry, this is maybe for the wider panel, um, but supposing that after reading a few of the kind of popular press articles that have been published about the crisis in science, uh, suppose a sort of you know, educated lay friend of yours came along and said, Joe, I get the impression about a quarter of all science is probably fake. What would you say to convince them otherwise today? I'm not sure. <laughs> I would probably have to argue from my intuitions, right? Um, uh, I, I think about uh, Joe's presentation at the last SPSP before uh, before Rona, where he said, you know, I think maybe something like between one to five percent of articles contain some fabricated data. Um, I think that that's a reasonable estimate. I don't know. I don't know how we could empirically estimate that. Um, just because it's it's so well concealed, even in the cases that we do find it, right? Um, something gets retracted. The retraction notice is often very polite and conciliatory and does not tell us about why things were retracted. People maybe quietly leave an institution or something like that, but we don't get the full story. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's all under fog of war at this point. Um, we really have no way to estimate how, how big a problem it is. Mm. Like just qu very, very quickly, I don't want to let this drop because I don't think I've ever spoken about this in public before, but I will, I will tell you my personal, uh, not my personal record, uh, the, the, worst, the worst case is something that shouldn't exist ever. And this is from a biological paper, which I will not name so I don't get your seminar series into trouble. 
there were a 19 internal attempts to make this a particular experimental model work in context. Anyone who knows laboratory biology, um, the vast majority of the paradigms are complicated. But 19 attempts, as uh, if you're thinking about a, uh, as a certain neatness with the, uh, with the, the 0.05 threshold, um, 19 attempts to be able to make it work, uh, and six individual external failed replications. Now, if you, you were saying previously, think of the value of one good retraction. Now, multiply that by the amount of money that it takes to do the amount of work that mm -hmm. goes into a multi-experiment series where you need to buy confocal microscopes and a ton of reagents and they are 96 well patch clamping machine. And yeah, no, I, I, that's exactly. Imagine the cost as that is multiplied across the vast majority of results which them, themselves are suffering from a continual pressure to present more and have a larger, neater thesis contained with the kind of synthesis of complicated ideas within the same space. Yeah. It is, I'm, yeah. So, so this, is why, this is why I bring up Elizabeth Bick, right? Um, Elizabeth Bick quit her job so that she could full-time focus on detecting duplicated or Photoshopped images in biology articles. And for the reasons you outlined just now, James, I would roughly estimate the value of the service that she provides at probably several million dollars a year. Um, she earns $900 a month through Patreon donations. This should be a full-time job that rewards her expertise and gets her health insurance and all these things that we want from it, you know, from this work. Um, but it's not doing that. Dr. Elson. Yeah, quite uh, early on, I think um, during the first half of your presentation, you said that um, this whole um, idea of, you know, um, uh, replicating studies that you have the strong suspicion are fraudulent is not um it's not sustainable so i wonder why um why has uh the journal of experimental social psychology decided to publish your replication or oh, not replication but um the the um, maximum positive control study um instead of retracting the earlier one, I mean, after you clearly showed that the data are not possible. Yeah. Um, so um, after I published this, I again asked the editor in chief of JESP to consider a retraction. Um, he said, send me a document and I'll try to make it happen. Um, but one of the challenges is um, in order to support a decision to retract based on kind of statistical reasoning like this. It's very helpful if, like Uri did with the uh, uh, Forrester and uh, Smeester sort of situations, if you can put a nice tidy p-value on it, because nobody can argue with the p-value. So if you can tie it up with a bow and say this is a two in a million chance or something like that, then an editor feels pretty comfortable retracting it. Um, I'm, I won't pretend to know uh, the editor's internal state, but it does seem like if you can put a nice clean p-value on things that that makes it much easier to support a, a retraction. And that's hard when I don't know exactly how to simulate some of these things or the p-value you get out of these things is so sensitive to the assumptions of what's plausible and what's implausible. It, sure, Joe, but what's the, what's the p-value of three to the power of 9,000? <laughs> There's a binomial probability. Yeah, um, you know, I, I that, I had to do that in log space, right? Um, and I couldn't tell you that off the top of my head. Um, so yeah, I think I'm right there. Uh, I, I just wish the editor would do something with that. Nick. Uh, three to the minus 9,000 is surely something like 10 to the minus 2,700. But um, the, I, I think this illustrates a, a wider point, which is that we're trying to do, or editors 
instinctively, I think, and I think most of us maybe instinctively are trying to do what we would, what we kind of call meta science using the methods of science. And I'm not sure that that is really going to get us anywhere. Uh, we are dealing fundamentally with problems due to the deficiencies of all kinds of individual humans. And um, at some point, you know, we have to accept that we run our society not by science. Um, we have a we don't have a judicial system in academia, but if we do, we can imagine a situation in which when you detect a problem, you are the policeman, you are the prosecutor. Uh, if you're lucky, there's a judge. The, um, the threshold for a guilty verdict is rather higher than one sees in death penalty cases. Um, and uh, it, I can just imagine, you know, a, a judge or a, a senior journal editor being a judge and the, and the murderer says, well, you're, you know, I know there's a one in 10 to the 785 chance that it's not my DNA, but hey, it's a chance. Yeah. Um, and, and, and at that point, judges, oh, good point. Mm, I don't want, and I think partly it's because senior academics tend to be very well-meaning people who don't spend a lot of time dealing with very, very devious individuals. That's, you know, that's why they went into academia apart from anything else. I think yeah. a lot of us probably don't really enjoy spending time in the company of highly devious individuals. <laughs> um, and so um, I think we're going to need a, an approach that has, if not less science in it, certainly proportionately less science in it. So for example, I, I, you know, your idea, yeah, we should submit the data. I think we would like, I would like to see us go to what I call the airport security model which is funny because 10 years ago, I would have groaned at that and gone, airport security doesn't work. Airport security works pretty well. Uh, first of all, we don't have many hijackings anymore, but also if you look how many uh, guns the TSA takes off people at, at airports who've just accidentally left them in their sports bag because they went to the gym in Dallas. And obviously when you do that, you take you know an AK-47 and three hand grenades, yeah. and then they forgot to take them out before they went to the airport. And uh, there, nobody's getting on a plane with a knife and getting drunk and kind of, you know, slashing out. So, uh, and when you go to the airport and the machine goes beep, you don't go, excuse me, I'm Professor Joe Hilgard. Why are you <laughs> asking me to take my shoes off? Don't yeah. you trust me? It's like, it's not a question of whether we trust you. Or not. You have to do that because it's part of the deal. And uh, we need to change that mentality to be, all right, in order to upload my manuscript, I've got to have a receipt from some digital system saying I deposited the data. And one time in 10, one time in five, the reviewers or the editor, the action editor will say, I tried to download your data and all I got was a picture of Mickey Mouse. What's <laughs> going on? Um, so that's what we need to do. The question yeah. then also is whether the publishers and to a lesser extent, the editors want to do it. And frankly, I don't think they do. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I think we should ask for it. So uh, just to, I think you probably know this, we're already 10 minutes over our maximum time, uh, which means you've you've won. But I'll give you the last word and then we can finish up there. Sure. Um, the last word is if we want scientific self-correction, we have to plan for it. We have to build for it. We have to ask for it. We have to hire for it. We have to pay for it. Um, and that's it. Thank you all so much for joining me here today. It's really been a treat. Thank you so much. And thanks to all the panelists, really outstanding. Uh, and thanks to all the attendees who are here. I'll make sure that Joe gets all of the questions you submitted. Uh, this has been great. Thanks everybody. Enjoy your Thank weekend. Thank you so much.